I'm Joel Beakey from Puritan Reform Seminary, and I want to bring you just an encouraging message in the midst of our discouraging times to press on in the work of the Lord, no matter what will come our way. And I want to do that, especially for people who've lost their jobs or lost a sense of being able to work on the mission to which they're devoted from just two verses, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's just three things I want to say about these two wonderful verses to encourage genuine Christians to keep running the race. The first is the mission that we have here in these verses. The second is the manner. And the third is the motivations we have to keep running the race. The mission is simply endurance. Actually, all three of the first verses of Hebrews 12 in the original Greek have the word endure in them. The Christian life is a life in which we're called to endure, we're called to press on all the way to the celestial city by the grace of our God. And so the picture of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is a picture of a large Grecian Colosseum in which there are thousands of fans cheering on runners who are running, not sprinting, but running steadily. And a Christian is called to run the race steadily, every day using the spiritual disciplines, every day in prayer, reading of scripture, meditation, fellowshipping with God's people, etc. Press on, endure, run the race every day. That's the message. That's the mission. Secondly, we're told how to do that. The manner. And the manner is both negative and positive. On the one side, we lay aside all sin. We aim to put a sword through sin. Sin is anti-God. We've got no business sinning as Christians. We're to reckon ourselves dead unto sin, Romans 6, 11, and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're to lay aside the sin of unbelief, which is what could be referred to as the sin that so easily besets us. We're to lay aside our own bosom or darling sins that we're prone to fall into. But ultimately, we're called to lay aside all sin and press on and endure. And so this time, perhaps you've lost your job, perhaps you're, you're lonely, perhaps you're depressed. Don't yield to Satan's devices to say it's not worth it to be a Christian. Just go ahead and sin or just go ahead and do this one thing you're not supposed to do one more time or, or click one more button on your internet than you're called to do and plunge into sin. So, Let's remember this. We run the race negatively by laying aside all sin, saying, Lord, help me in this battle. Keep me from the evil one. Let me run the race looking to Jesus. That's the positive side. And that's even bigger. We run the race by always looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When I was a young man and ran track, our coach always said, I'll be standing at the finish line and you look at me. Don't look at the runners beside you or the runners behind you. You lose half a step, but you run for me. You look at me. Well, Jesus Christ is our great exponent of faith. He's the author of faith. He's the continuer of faith. He's the finisher of faith. He modeled faith himself all the way to the end, all the way to Golgotha. He didn't give up. And he says, look at me. I will give you the strength to run 
all the way to the end. And thirdly, this text gives us five motivations to run the race. Four of them center on Jesus. Notice what verse 2 says. Number one, we're to run the race, we're to be motivated to run it by what he endured. He endured the cross, the cross. Our crosses are all small compared to his cross, all of them. If he endured all the way to the end, the sin-free Savior for sinful people like us, ought not we sinners saved by grace endure with our crosses, taking them up cheerfully for his sake and his glory? Be motivated by what he endured. Secondly, be motivated by what he rejoiced in. He rejoiced in bearing the cross, we're told, for the joy that was set before him, verse 2 says. And what was that joy? Well, that joy ultimately is that the day is coming when he will present his father, the entire redeemed people given to him by his father from eternity past and say, here am I, father, and all those whom thou hast given me. And he will rejoice in his completed work at the right hand of the Father. And if that's his joy that enabled him to endure, we ought to have that, a similar joy where we say, our future is in heaven to be with Jesus, united in utopian marriage with him forever, so we will endure whatever temporary discomfort and disappointment we have in this life because we're on our way to everlasting glory. Like the Puritan John Trapp said, he who rides to be crowned ought not fear a few rainy days here on earth. So be motivated by Jesus, by what he endured, by what he rejoiced in, and thirdly, by what he despised. He despised the shame to, to die the death of a treasonous murderer and thief on the cross. That's what the people thought of Jesus is a shameful thing. But he wanted to do the will of his Father, so he despised the shame. That's the way we should live too. The fear of God, which values the smiles and frowns of God is greater than the smiles and frowns of men. That's what should motivate us. Despise the shame. Despise what people say of Christians in degrading terms. Look to Jesus. He despised the shame. Live for him. His meat and drink was to do the will of his Father. Let that be your meat and drink as well. And fourthly, be motivated by where he is now. He sat down, the verse says, at the right hand of the throne of God. What a, what a tremendous motivation. What's he doing there? He's interceding for you, dear believer. Every single second, Hebrews 7.25, he ever lives to make intercession for us. I call the intercession of Christ the most underrated doctrine in all the Bible. If he's interceding for me effectually every single second, why ought, I, what, why ought not I run the race all the way to the end for his glory? So there's four motivations from Jesus himself. And then one more motivation, go back to the beginning of verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So as we run this race in the great Colosseum of life, what we need to know, says the author to the Hebrews, and the Hebrews were discouraged, they were being persecuted. We need to know that all the Old Testament saints are in our stands, as it were, with their lives, saying, we endured to the end even before we had clarity about Jesus on the cross. You now can look back to the finished work of salvation. You ought to have even more clarity. If we persevered to the end, Abraham, Joseph, David, etc., why ought not you persevere to the end? But you see, we today have many more people in our stands cheering us on. Run the race to the end. Don't give up. Keep on keeping on. Because we have the New Testament saints. We have the, we have the uh, saints of 2,000 years of church history. We have 
God-fearing people in our churches right now who cheer us on. We've got pastors and elders that cheer us on. We've got family members who's gone, who've gone before us into glory who cheer us on. Uh, my wife cheers me on when I'm discouraged. She just tells me, don't worry, honey. God will help you one more time when you get up there to preach when you feel unfit to do so. You see, you persevere by looking to Jesus primarily, but also by looking to the saints of all ages. And you say to yourself, am I going to give up on this race when they all persevered to the end by the grace of God? So if you lost your job, if you're in the midst of many depressing circumstances, don't give up. Run the race set before you, the best race ever on your way to glory. Keep on keeping on, and God will bless you. Amen.